My name is Laurie A. Couture. I'm the author of Instead of Medicating and Punishing and the upcoming book, Nurturing and Empowering Our Sons. The title of my presentation is Developmental Trauma, the Root of Suicidality and Behavioral, Emotional, and Learning Problems in Boys and Young Men. On September 27, 2017, every parent's worst nightmare struck my family. My 23-year-old son Bryson went missing and a week later his body was found. Bryson had taken his life. I adopted Bryson at the age of 11 from the foster care system. Bryson lived in at least two residential facilities and up to 13 different foster and respite homes. A brilliant, quirky, loving, adventurous, creative boy, Bryson suffered limbic system shattering traumas at the hands of his birth family and of a foster care system that couldn't meet his needs. This included both illegal and legal traumas. I'm here today as a parent and a professional to sound the alarm that we must address and remedy the silent pain of our boys and young men and the neglect that they're enduring in our medical, mental health, educational, legal, and human service institutions. A brilliant mind like Bryson's had so much to offer to society, but Bryson felt that there was no place for him in our society. Perhaps the 35,000 other boys and men who also ended their lives in 2017 felt the same way. But what would cause a boy or a young man to feel that there's no place for him in society? Developmental trauma. Developmental trauma suffered in childhood, including during adolescence, is at the root of suicidal ideation and behavioral learning and emotional problems in boys and young men. This is very different from what we hear in the media and what we're told by society's institutions about the causes of male behavioral problems. We often hear that the problems young males exhibit are inherent to their maleness. For example, that their problems are behavioral rather than a result of distress or trauma, or that boys and young men are inherently violent rather than victims of violence that the cause is testosterone levels rather than high levels of cortisol, that they weren't taught respect rather than they weren't treated with respect. And the common one is that it's a result of toxic masculinity rather than a toxic childhood. However, neuroscience supports the trauma-based cause. Let's refresh our understanding of trauma. Trauma is individual. It is emotional injury that results when an individual feels powerless to cope with intense or chronic distress. When a boy feels distressed, this is the absence of homeostasis. If this distress is unsoothed, the limbic system becomes triggered, which then triggers high cortisol levels, which leads to a fight, flight, or freeze reaction. This can lead to dissociation, which causes emotional injury or what we call trauma. Trauma includes professionally recognized traumas such as child abuse and neglect, loss, abandonment, and alienation of a parent or by a parent. Often the dads are alienated from sons. Traumas that are recognized include bullying and community violence and exposure to sexually explicit and violent media. Indeed, these tragedies are deeply traumatizing to boys. However, there are many legal practices in our society that raise cortisol levels and cause children, especially boys, to feel powerless and unable to cope with the distress. These practices also harm the parent-child attachment relationship. The attachment cycle applies to children of all ages, from infancy to late adolescence. 
The child has a need, the child expresses his need, and the parent ideally meets the need as soon as possible. This leads the child to feel homeostasis, which is a feeling of all systems inside and out are feeling pretty good. The feelings that result are joy, trust, safety, and calm. And as a result, this creates a blueprint of secure attachment. However, most boys in our culture have a very different experience. The child has a need, the child expresses his need, and the parent delays or fails to meet the need. This leads to the child feeling distress. This is not a state of homeostasis. Distress is an alarm state, and it results in feelings of anxiety, fear, mistrust, a lack of safety, anger, rage, and depression. And this creates a blueprint of disrupted or insecure attachment. And sadly, most boys and young men are functioning from a disrupted parent-child attachment blueprint. Why is this so important to understand? Because attachment disruption is trauma. The crucial role of attachment in the behavior of boys and young men gets very little attention in our fields. The best research comes from the fields of cultural anthropology. James W. Prescott, Margaret Mead, Mary Ainsworth, Ashley Montague, James DeMeo, and many others studied the contrast between parenting and educational practices in agricultural and in industrial cultures versus in peaceful hunter-gatherer cultures and subsequent levels of mental illness and violence in those societies. And what they found was striking. They found that most of the parenting and educational practices in hunter-gatherer tribal societies promoted secure attachment, while most of the parenting and educational practices in agricultural and in industrial cultures promoted attachment disruption. For example, in peaceful hunter-gatherer cultures, they found high levels of nurturance, intergenerational families, high levels of skin-to-skin -skin contact, breastfeeding for at least two and a half years and up to six years of age, no genital mutilation, including of boys, no punishment of children, including no corporal punishment, high levels of play and freedom, natural learning without schooling, no early parent-child separation, high degrees of co-sleeping, and as a result, these cultures had low levels of child abuse, low levels of mental illness, low levels of behavioral problems, and low levels of community and social violence. In contrast, in agricultural and in industrialized cultures, they found low levels of nurturance, split or broken families, low levels of skin-to-skin -skin contact between children and parents, low levels of breastfeeding, including lots of bottle feeding. They found crib sleeping, male genital mutilation, high degrees of punishment, including corporal punishment, forced schooling and forced work for teenagers, low degrees of play and freedom, and high degrees of early childhood separation from parents. And as a result, they found in these societies, high levels of child abuse and neglect, high levels of mental illness, high levels of child behavioral problems, and high degrees of social and community violence. The researchers also found that boys are more likely than girls to suffer parenting and educational practices that cause trauma and disrupt parent-child attachment. Traumatic parenting practices that are legal but still cause trauma to children include male genital mutilation, or what our society likes to call circumcision, physical punishment, or spanking, lack of skin-to-skin -skin and emotional nurturance by parents, punitive, permissive, or helicopter parenting, emotional withdrawal from sons by both mothers and fathers, an early separation between parents and children due to daycare and schooling. 
Traumatic educational practices include, again, that early separation from parents. The child's biological needs are delayed or denied. Children aren't even allowed to go to the bathroom when they need to in school, or eat a snack, or get a drink of water when they need. Schools are punitive. There's a lack of play and movement, and a gross lack of sensory stimulation. When all the studies show that boys need to move in order to learn, there are also mental health practices that promote trauma, such as reflexive psychotropic medicating of children, ignoring the family and school dynamic as causes of a child's behavior, ignoring the child's unmet needs, ignoring attachment disruption and trauma as causes of sy symptoms. Most mental health counselors are untrained in trauma and the attachment model. They diagnose merely by the DSM-5 category, and they're trained in the biological rather than the human attachment model. There are also many medical practices that promote child trauma, especially of boys. Again, male genital mutilation or circumcision. There's no medically necessary reason to be cutting healthy tissue off a boy's body, especially off his most intimate and private organ. The medical field ignores the severity of screen use in boys. They ignore the role of diet on behavioral and health, including that refined sugar, grains, and dairy are as addictive as cocaine, and soy is an endocrine disruptor, causing boys to feel less masculine. There's also no advocacy for boys' developmental needs, for nurturance, for play, movement, physical activity, nature, sensory stimulation, and biological homeostasis while at school. There's also no acknowledgement of trauma's effects on the boy's body and psyche. We also have trauma-promoting public policy practice. Violence against males is virtually ignored, especially sexual and domestic violence. There are biased methods used to collect and formulate statistics. For example, crime and hospital statistics are used to determine who is a victim and who is a perpetrator. Male victims and female perpetrators are often omitted from studies. The FBI didn't even consider rape of males to count or to be rape until 2012. Female victims and male perpetrators are often the focus of studies. Loaded language is used, not sensitive to male subjects, such as asking male victims, potential male victims, were you raped? In empirical studies, highlights are pulled for the media that support the stereotype and ignore the raw data. Also, there are seven governmental offices for women and zero for men. There are no comparable andrology and men's health focus in the medical field, or it's very small in comparison when it does exist. And sadly, female empowerment is to the exclusion of male empowerment. There are also trauma-promoting laws and legal practices. Again, male genital mutilation is legal when committed against the genitals of males, but not females. Corporal punishment against children 18 and under is legal illegal towards all other citizens of all other ages. There's a lack of rights for fathers. Male and female victims are not treated equally under the law. Male defendants receive harsher punishments than female defendants. And female defendants receive weak or no punishment at all. Developmental trauma harms boys on every developmental level, on their epigenetic level, the neurological, physical, psychological, behavioral, social, sexual, and moral, ethical levels. Young male symptoms of trauma and distress include acting out, hyperactivity, anger, rage, defiance, withdrawal and apathy, alexithymia, stoicism, acting overly independent, behavioral addictions, chemical addictions, controlling behavior, and aggression and violence, including emotional, physical, and sexual. Concerningly, male ways of expressing distress and trauma 
tend to be overlooked, punished, or misunderstood in our society. How are distressed males handled by our society? They're stereotyped and shamed. They're punished and controlled. They're labeled and diagnosed with collections of symptoms such as ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, and conduct disorder. These are merely collections of symptoms. They're fraudulent diagnoses. Young acting out males are put through the legal system rather than through the mental health system and they're neglected by the human services. They're often not included in victim statistics and they're omitted from social justice and human rights efforts. Fellow professionals, we must do better to understand and meet the developmental needs of boys and young men. What do boys and young men need from us as professionals and from our society's institutions? Well, they need nurturance. They need protection. They need understanding and compassion. They need developmentally appropriate practice, male sensitive interventions, and empowerment. If my son, who you see pictured here at his happiest, had received this outside the home, He'd be standing in this video with me, presenting to you with me. What happens if the needs of boys and young men continue to remain unmet? Well, we will continue to see educational failure. Boys and young men are failing at all levels of education, from preschool to graduate school. We will continue to see behavioral and substance addictions. Failure to launch, that's so common in our millennial young men. Violence, suicide, and homicide in young males. Contrary to what our society's institutions and the media tell us, empirical victim report studies find that boys and men are the primary victims of suicide. In fact, 80% of suicide victims are boys and young men. 80%! Let that number sink in. They are the primary victims of homicide, child abuse, corporal punishment in both home and school. They are the primary victims of community violence and parenting discrimination. Boys and men are the equal victims of domestic and partner abuse, sexual assault and rape, and one New York study found that 50% of child sex trafficking victims were boys and young men. We must abolish discriminatory practices against boys and young men in our society's institutions and in the media. These include male genital mutilation, corporal punishment, developmentally inappropriate education, sexual and domestic violence programs that typecast males as predators and females as victims, ideology that views masculinity as toxic and femininity as benevolent campaigns that empower only women and girls and omit men and boys, and the discriminatory way in which the legal system treats fathers. What are some of the interventions that we can do to support boys and young men? Well, we can strengthen parent-son attachments between boys and both their mothers and their fathers. We can focus on boy-friendly alternative education, such as homeschooling, play-based schooling, or nature-based schools. We can focus on brain-based trauma treatments, such as EMDR, neurofeedback, and cranial electrostimulation devices, which are handheld devices that people can use in their own homes. We can focus on attachment family therapy, such as dyadic developmental psychotherapy or theraplay. We can abolish institutional discrimination against boys and young men. We can raise awareness about male victims of sexual and dating violence and launch public health campaigns that focus on male needs. 
we can launch social justice efforts that focus on the inequalities suffered by males. And most importantly, perhaps, suicide prevention must begin with trauma prevention. I'm Laurie A. Couture, author of Instead of Medicating and Punishing in the upcoming book, Nurturing and Empowering Our Sons. You can learn more at laurieacouture.com. Thank you very much.